talked to her, I was telling her what I was preaching on today, and she showed me that video. It just it was uh, made me laugh because it's a good. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tie in a whole lot to the lesson, but it um, it's a good intro to talking about love and talking about what we're going to be discussing this morning. Uh, the world the world tells us a lot about love and tells us what love is supposed to be. We get our definition of love. Obviously, this guy got his definition of love from songs. Right? We hear a lot of songs that talk a lot about love. It seems like every genre of music you listen to, there's going to be sermons. Pardon me, sorry. There's going to be um, stories about love and lessons about love in those in those songs. Maybe we get our meaning of love from movies. Maybe we get our meaning of love from um, books. Maybe it's from poems or plays or and on and on and on that list goes. But what, I've, what we've learned and what I think we all know is that the world knows nothing about love. The world doesn't know anything about love. The world has it all wrong. So instead of talking about what love is and being confused about love and all those things like the video, like the guy in the video was talking about, we're going to talk about how to love God and how everything else after that will just fall into place when we learn how to love God. So let's, let's open with prayer. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you do for us. You are a good God. You watch over us. You take care of us. You humble us, Lord. We thank you for uh, creating us. We thank you for blessing us in all the ways that you do, Lord. We pray that um, this morning that it's your words that are spoken and not my own, Lord. We thank you for um, just for giving us and, and showing us what love is all about, Lord. I pray that uh, through next couple weeks, we can learn a little bit about how we're supposed to love you back. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was trying to figure out what to title the sermon today, and, you know, we could have called it The Greatest Commandment, we could have called it Love, but I just thought simply Luke 10, 27 uh, was, a, was a good title for the next two weeks. I'll be preaching the next two weeks. Phil isn't here. He's in Colorado, visiting family. I think he's in Colorado. Anybody know? I think that's where he is. But uh, in Luke 10, 27, it, that is known as the greatest commandment. So if you are open to 1027, you can read there where it tells us to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. All right. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. We also see that same scripture used in Mark. Or, uh, in Mark, in, sorry, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, where it uh, it just says heart and soul and mind. In Mark twelve twenty-eight, it says heart, soul, mind, and strength. But all of those, all of those things, all of those scriptures that we read in the Gospels come from one place in the Old Testament. Anybody know? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, where it says starts in verse four and it says the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And the Hebrew there, word there for one is ekad, which means the plural word for one. The plural word for one is only used twice in the Old Testament. Once there, and once when it says the two shall become one flesh. So we see in Deuteronomy 6 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Plural word for one. And then after that it says, the love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. As I mentioned, mind there. But when we look at this word all, I think it's really significant to see what they did in each of those scriptures. It never says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and then it just mentions, and your soul, and your mind, and your strength. It repeats that word all before every single one of those things. So it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. And I don't know exactly why. They put have to, they had to specify all before each and every one of those four, but I think there is some significance to it just based on my own speculation. Um, a lot of times, people like to interpret the Bible however they however they see fit that best fits their lives and best fits their worldview. And so, when we see if, we, if it just said love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, people might say, well, he didn't say to love the Lord God with all of your soul and all of your strength. He only said it about all of your heart. I don't know. Like I said, that's just my own speculation. Maybe some of you who are more um, versed in the Bible and, and scholarly than me might have a good explanation for that. That's just 
That's just what I think, that they specify and they put that in there because it's important. Each of those four pieces of who we are as people is important. So when we look at that word all, that means all of us, all of our allegiance, all of our loyalty needs to go into loving the Lord our God. All of us. We look at that word allegiance and we say it has to be to God, to God alone. I know we all grew up, you know, they don't say it anymore in school, but we all grew up saying I pledge allegiance to the flag. Yes, we can have allegiances to other things. I have an allegiance to my wife. I have an allegiance to my kids. I have an allegiance to this church. But ultimately, all of those funnel up to my allegiance for God. That's where it all starts. That's where it all comes from. And everything flows from there. My overall, overarching allegiance, the umbrella of everything that I do and who I am, is my allegiance to God. So loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength shows that every part of me and who I am needs to put my full allegiance and my full loyalty and my full devotion in the Lord our God. Amen? A total loyalty. I truly believe that when people give, I truly believe that when people give all their loyalty to God, then all other relationships in life will work out. Whether that be our relationships with friends, relationships in our marriages, relationships in our church, relationships at work, acquaintances, whatever that may be, that if our full allegiance, if we give everything over to God and let Him rule every part of us and who we are, everything else after that will start to work out. Everything after that will start to work out. We see over and over and over again, example after example after example of people, of relationships being restored when all of them is given to God. All of them is given to Christ Jesus. All of them is given to the Holy Spirit. So today, as we go through this greatest commandment, loving the Lord your God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're going to talk today about our heart and about our soul. And then next week, we're going to finish up in talking about our mind and our strength. And we'll have a little table analogy that, that I really like that goes along with this as well. So, uh, so that's today. So we're going to start off talking about our heart, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. And why does it talk about the heart first? Why does it not say loving the Lord, Lord your God with all of your soul, heart, mind, and strength? Is there significance to it mentioning the heart before mentioning the soul? I think there is. The Old and the New Testament show us a spiritual relationship with God starts from within. I know a lot of times we say, when we study the New Testament, we say what Jesus did is he took all the laws and all the things that they had to follow, and he made it all about the heart. That's what, you know, I've I've grown up saying for a long time, and and believing for a long time, but I think when you really go back and read the Old Testament and see what it's all about, it was just as much about the heart in the Old Testament as it is about the heart in the New Testament. It wasn't just a bunch of rules and, and regulations and laws that they had to follow, in the Old Testament, and the New Testament, it's not about law, it's just about following God and about making your heart be in the right place. It was just as much the same then as it is now. God's never changed. He was and is and is to come. He's always been the same from the very beginning to the very end. He made it about the heart in the beginning, and he continued making it about the heart after Jesus came as well. The Bible talks a lot about out our heart and talks a lot about what our heart is supposed to be when it comes to God, how our heart is supposed to feel, how our heart is supposed to to live. It tells us that we cannot serve two masters in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, that we cannot as people serve two masters. I can't say I am in love with God, but also I am in love with something else in the world. We can't, we can't do both. It has to be all about one or all about the other. And when we make it all about God, then like we said earlier, everything else will fall into place. Everything else will fit. In Proverbs 4.23, Proverbs 4.23, it tells us to guard your heart because from it flow the springs of life. To guard your heart because from it, from our heart, 
flow the springs of life. So what does that mean? What we put into ourselves is what our life will become. What we put into our heart is who we are going to be, is what is going to influence us, is how we're going to talk, how we're going to think, how we're going to act, what we're going to do. What goes in, what ultimately says, is what's going to come out. Okay, it all starts with our heart. It starts with what's being put in here. Proverbs 2 just, uh, just a couple chapters from Proverbs 4, it says to store up God's commands from within you. Store up God's commands from within you. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we know in verse 5 it says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. But then after that, it says write these commands on your heart. It starts there. So it lists the heart, soul, and, and strength but then it says to write these commands on your heart. And then after that, it tells us to do what? Anybody know? We start teaching them. We never stop talking about them. We write them on our doorstep. Put them on your walls. Tell your children day and night as you walk along with them holding their hand, you're teaching them about the laws and the commands and what it means to follow Jesus Christ. That's what it tells us next. First it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then it says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. Then it says to write all of these commands on your heart. And then it says, live it out. Live it out. Start telling everybody about it. Don't be ashamed or afraid of these commands that you've put on your heart because it's telling you that when you're constantly putting these commands on your heart, when you're constantly writing these commands on your heart, when you're constantly memorizing scripture, reading scripture, being involved in church, singing praises to God, that it's just going to flow out of you. It's just going to flow out of you. And I think it's obvious when you see people who are so filled with God, so filled in their heart with God, that it just, they exude God. You know, it just, it flows out of them. You know right away that they're a lover of God. Jeremiah 21, or 31, 33 tells us to write the law on our hearts. So kind of the similar to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Matthew 6, 21 says, Where's, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we see Old and New Testament, a lot of scripture talking about putting the Bible, putting the word of God, putting who God is in your heart first, within you. That's what it's supposed to be about. Everything starts from our heart. Our heart determines everything after that, the soul, mind, and strength. We should be with our heart. We should be desiring to know God. We should crave to follow Jesus, and we should want to submit to the Holy Spirit. We should want to desire to know God. We should want to cr this, this craving to follow Jesus, and we should want to submit our life to the Holy Spirit. When we talk about our heart, a lot of times we, we, you have to talk about love and love for people. When you looked at Jesus and his life, we know that in the Gospels, all he did was love people. That's what he did. He didn't care about their entire story or, or their personality or anything like that. He said, we need to love people all the same. But a lot of times, as Christians, our love isn't necessarily all that unconditional, right? I mean, people irritate us, don't they? Don't we get mad at, at people? Don't we get upset with how somebody might be acting or, or who somebody might be? When we look at these different things and we start, in our minds, we start passing judgments off to other people. And we start saying, I, I think that this person should be this way or this person should do that. You know, because if they did that, maybe I would like them more. Maybe I wouldn't be so irritated by them or their personality or something like that. When we start doing that, I truly believe that we're taking the focus off of God and we're putting it on ourselves. We're saying... When we start doing that, we're saying, I'm sorry, God, your creation isn't good enough. Who you created that person to be isn't good enough for me. 
so I'm going to let them irritate me, and I'm going to let them make me mad. That's not a place that we want to be as Christians. It's not a place that we want to be where we start playing God and saying, I'm sorry, God, what you did in, in this person, I don't like. So I don't want to be friends with that person anymore. You know, what you did um, wasn't good enough for me. We start taking on the role of God and saying, God, your creation wasn't perfect. I know better than you. I mean, my goodness, that's not a place that we want to be as Christians. And a lot of that starts from within the heart. It starts from, the, from deep down inside of us of who we are as a person. What's wrong with us? What do we have that needs to be fixed? What do we have that needs to be righted? How do we, as a Christian body, need to love people different? If we love people the way Jesus loved people, the world would be way different. It really would. And I know we say that all the time, but I I challenge you to take time and say, do I love God with all of my heart? Do I love God with all of my heart? And if I don't, what can I do to love God with all of my heart? And when I do, how would my life look different? How would my treating of people look different? How would everything that I am look different? Our heart is the core. It starts from within here. And we've got to have a right heart before we can have a right everything else. Um, Next is the soul. I remember, um, it was just just up to a few weeks ago, I I really struggled with with what it meant when it said, love the Lord your God with all of your soul. I've I've asked a, a lot of, even up at camp, I was asking a lot of people questions about what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all of your soul? What, is, what does that look like? You know, I don't really fully understand it. And when you start reading Scripture, and start reading Scripture about the soul, and about what Scripture says the soul is, it starts to make a whole lot of sense. It's funny, it's like, I've always wondered this, but I never really went to the Bible and read a whole lot about it. Huh. Shocking that you go to the Word of God, and all of a sudden it all starts to make a whole lot of sense. Amazing how that works, isn't it? But when we talk about our soul, you could see from, from Moses writing the, um, the first five books of the Bible that they had an understanding, even, even from the very beginning, of what our soul is and how we're supposed to love with our soul, love God with our soul. The soul refers to one's whole being. The soul refers to who we are as a person. Who am I, Scott McGreeny? at my soul, all right? It starts with my heart, then it spreads to my soul. My soul is my identity. It's who God created me to be. Just like your soul is your identity, who God created you to be, separate from me. He created you different than he created me. Your soul is yours, my soul is mine, but they're all interconnected to God um, from the very beginning. So when we talk about our soul, our soul is everything about us. Like I said, who we are as a person, Our heart has a big, big influence on our soul. Our heart determines what our soul is going to be. So like we said, it starts from love within, and then it moves out. It moves out, saying that everything about us as a person should be declaring that Jesus is Lord. Our heart loves first, and then it moves out to our soul. When my heart is in the wrong place, and my heart Uh, doesn't want to love God in my heart anymore, and my heart wants to go a separate way, and my heart starts to say that I don't really believe there is a God anymore, then our soul and who we are as a person changes. We change as a person. When my heart says, I want to do what I want to do, I don't care about anybody else, I only care about me, who I am as a person starts to change. Have you ever seen that happen in someone? Have you seen the heart, the heart change? And then the person after that, who they are, starts to change as a person. Have you seen that happen? I have. And it's it's sad. It's sad to watch a heart change and then the person and who they are and who they are at their core start to change after that. That's why we say it. It starts from deep within, from within our heart. And we start changing this. And we start writing on our heart. We start memorizing scripture and worshiping and being around Christians. And then the 
the who we are, the within, the inner core, the being of us starts to change. And we start to become something different. We start to become a child of God. Do your actions exhibit God? Just questions to ask yourself. Does your speech, how you talk, things you say, does that exhibit God? If you're loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul, you'll see your actions change. You'll see the way you talk and the words you use start to change. What about the, you know, going a little bit, a little bit harder for a lot of people, what about the TV shows that we watch? Will that start to change? If our heart and our soul is being transformed into a follower and, a, and into a full 100% child of God, will we start watching different TV shows or stop watching different TV shows? What about the music we listen to? You know, will that start to change? And it's very, like I stand here not saying, hey, I'm anything, anything great. It's very convicting. Every single time I start to really study about loving the Lord my God with all of my heart and all of my soul, the convictions just start happening, and that's the Holy Spirit telling me that maybe we need to do something a little bit different in my life. My convictions aren't your convictions, and I want to be very clear about that. Okay, just because I'm convicted not to watch some certain TV show doesn't mean that's your conviction. God, the Holy Spirit, convicts every single person differently. And just because something might be super wrong for me doesn't mean it's going to be wrong for you and vice versa. All right. And so that's, again, that's an important thing to remember because, again, that's when we start passing judgment. Well, I, I, I'm convicted not to watch that. Why are you still watching it? You know, maybe you shouldn't be doing that anymore. Well, maybe the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted you to do that yet. Or maybe the Holy Spirit told you that was okay. You know, but it's important to understand and to realize that everybody's convictions are different when our soul and our inner being starts to change into something that God wants us to be, that we're going to see changes happen in our life. We're going to see things different in our life. We're going to be convicted by different things. So ask yourself, when it comes to all aspects of your life, even if you felt like you have changed a lot since you've become a Christian or since you've been more convicted by, by listening to the Holy Spirit, even if you have changed, do you need to change more? Do I need to do more in my life to exude Jesus Christ? Do I need to do more in my life to allow the Holy Spirit to live out of me even stronger? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. That's a, that's a question that you have to ponder on, and you have to answer, and you have to go to God with. You see, the soul, the soul cannot be, we can't compartmentalize our soul. We can't do it. We can't say, well, for now, for tonight, because I really want to do this, I'm just going to put my soul over here so that I can go be involved in this thing that's going on over here that maybe doesn't follow what the Bible teaches. We can't push the soul aside because the soul is you. The soul is us. We can't say, I'm just going to put my soul in the box for the night and, and, and do what I want to do this Sunday, or I mean this day of the week. We can't do that. Maybe we can do that with our mind. We can, we can say, I just don't want to think about right, right now. We can kind of shove that to the back of our mind and then allow ourselves to think about the things we want to think about. It's a little bit easier with your mind or with your strength. I don't want to serve the church like we'll talk about next week. I want to do things my own way. But with your soul, you can't do that. Your soul is you. You can't break yourself up into a bunch of different pieces. It can't be compartmentalized. To love God with all of your soul is to love God with all of your being. To love God with all of your soul is to love God with all of you. All of you. I want to read some scriptures about the soul that I really like. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 says, But if from there you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all of your heart first, and then if you seek him with all of your soul. That's Deuteronomy 4.29. If you seek him, you will find him. So be prepared. If you leave this Sunday and you say, I'm going to start seeking God and start learning what it is to love God with all of my heart and all of my soul, be prepared for what God's going to do in your life. Be prepared for the convictions that you might face because it might rock you just a little bit. And that's okay because I think that's what is supposed to happen. 
Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I think that kind of goes into the compartmentalizing things. We can't give something in exchange for our soul. Our soul is us. It's who we are. Psalm 62, verse 1 says, Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. My soul, my inner being, who I am, finds rest in God. Psalms 139, 13 through 14. For you are created my inmost being. Other versions, when you look at the Hebrew word, can translate as you created my soul, okay, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So when we know that God created us in our innermost being, our soul, we know that full well that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 63, verse 1, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being, there it is again, whole being, that's my soul, everything within me, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Psalms 103, verse 1, we just sang this in the 10,000 Reasons song today. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, all of my soul, all of me, my being, should be praising God every, in every aspect of my life is about praising God. Does that mean that I go to work and every time I'm on the phone, I have to talk about God to every person in every meeting and, and conference call? No, that's not what that means. It doesn't mean that every conversation I have, God has to even come up. It just means that our life is about God. That is who I am. Who I am is, is God, is a part of God. That's what that means. All right? Um, Psalms 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. Other verses, versions say my soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. Last one, Joshua 22, 5. says, but be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and then here's Joshua's ending, and to serve him with all of your heart and all of your soul. Joshua got that as well. He sees the importance of the heart and the soul. I've taught for to the youth group for a lot of years um, what, I, what I think the Eastern religions really have right. And it's not something that we talk a lot about in the Western religion side of things because they're so big on it. But I think they, honestly, I think they got it from the Israelites. They got it from the Old Testament writings. And how they talk about how everything is interconnected. It's a very Eastern religion type thing to hear that we're all interconnected. That um, everything, they, you know, some religions say they're Atman, their soul and that, and that soul is connected to every other soul. Uh, I, like I said, I truly believe that that thinking came from, from the Old Testament writings, from Judaism, from the Israelites, from the belief in God, where everything started and then spread from there. And because they talk about it so much, it sounds a little weird for the Western religions to, to talk about it. But I think we should be talking about it more. And the reason why I say that is because I do. I truly believe that all of us, through our souls, are interconnected. It tells us in Genesis 2-7 that when we were created, God breathed the breath of life into us. And we became a living being. So the same breath of life that was, that was breathed into me is the same, came from the same breath of life that was breathed into you, every one of you. So through all of us, we have this breath of life that was breathed into us by God. It tells us that we are created in the image of God in Genesis 127. There is an interconnection. The reason why I say that is because have you ever watched someone just praising God and worshiping God and you look at that person and you say, man, I just feel like right now I just feel, I feel like I need to be worshiping God right now. Or you see someone serving God, you see their life for God and it's inspiring. And you say, 
there's something deep inside me that wants what they have. There's something deep inside me that wants to serve the way they serve, wants to love the way they love, wants to worship the way they worship. I think that something deep in th- down inside of us is our soul, is our innermost being, is the breath of life that God breathed into us and makes us interconnected in that way. It's almost like when I look at that person and I say, I want that. I want what that person has. It's almost like my soul is calling out to their soul and saying, I want that connection. I want to see and I want to be the way you are being because you are being as God is and I want to be more like that. So like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a different way to think a little bit, but we see that talked about a lot through the Old Testament and especially the first five books of the Bible when pr- predominantly you saw a lot of of uh, Judaism being taught back then before before the spread before the world started to spread out and other religions started to pop up they all came from one core place and that place was the Jews and that place was God okay so as we wrap things up for today I want us to remember that with our heart with our heart, that's where we kickstart everything. From our heart, like I mentioned earlier, we must desire to know God. From our heart, we must crave to follow Jesus. And from our heart, we must submit to the Holy Spirit. From there, it spreads to our entire being. It becomes who we are. It's our identity. It's the love for God from our soul that will start pouring out of us. Next week, we're going to finish up, like I said at the beginning, with mind and with strength. But for today and for this week, I challenge you to survey your heart and your soul, and I ask you, are you truly loving God right now with all of your heart and with all of your soul?